production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Friday, November 10th and I am Mark Owens, Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Team NEO and the Honorary Consul of Ireland in Ohio. It is my distinct honour to welcome Her Excellency Geraldine Byrne Nason, Ambassador of Ireland to the United States, someone I've got to know very well since her appointment to her role in 2022. Over the last several years, Ireland has shown remarkable resilience in the face of global economic shocks. The nation is working through the aftermath of Brexit, the COVID-19 pandemic, and upended peace and stability from the devastating consequences of the war in Ukraine. This also marks 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement, which ended most of the violence of the troubles of the north of Ireland, a place I called home for 20 plus years. Now, its relationship with Ohio has only grown stronger. Direct flights from Cleveland to Dublin, Ireland, positions Cleveland and Northeast Ohio as a global destination. The direct route to Ireland is also estimated to generate $85 million of economic impact on the Northeast Ohio economy over the next three years. Many of us in this room, including my colleagues at Team NEO, played a critical role in securing this new route, one that is performing quite well. A native of County Louth, Ambassador Byrne Nason assumed her role as Ireland's 19th Ambassador to the United States in August 2022. Previously, she spent five years as Ireland's Ambassador to the United States and served in the Security Council as an elected member. During her career, Ambassador Byrne Nason has served in Brussels, New York, Paris, Vienna, and Helsinki, and was also Secretary General of Ireland's Economic Management Council, where from 2011, in 2014, she was the highest ranking female public servant in Ireland. Moderating this conversation today is the wonderful Karina Van Vliet, the CEO of Cleveland Council on World Affairs and co-chair of the City Club Global Issues Member Committee. Karina has also served as a political affairs officer at the United Nations from 2006 to 2014 and served as a senior advisor to the 2015 Nobel Peace Prize Forum. If you have any questions for our speaker, you can text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. And the City Club staff will try and work it into the second half of the program. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Byrne Nason and Karina Van Vliet. Karina. Thank you, Mark. And Ambassador Bernason, as a proud member of the City Club of Cleveland, allow me to welcome you uh, to this stage and to welcome you for your second time to Cleveland. It's uh, the Ambassador's second visit to our city. We're delighted to have you back. And you're here, I understand, for a couple of days in Cleveland. And to begin, we would love to hear about your program of visit. Well, thank you very much, Karina. It's absolutely wonderful to be back. Uh, I promised on my first very brief visit that I would get back. I've just been, as Mark Owens has said, uh, here for one year. Uh, I think it says something that I'm back here again. It says something about the depth and the warmth of the relations uh, that we have um, with Cleveland. I wanted to recognize your former ambassador to Ireland, Ed Crawford, who's here with us today. <laughs> and of course, it, part of my visit is really it's a celebratory one. I'm here, uh, so to speak, to cut the ribbon for Mark Owen, our Mark Owens, our wonderful honorary consul here in Cleveland. You know, it was a strategic decision for Ireland to open a consulate here, um, but we made a fantastic choice when we decided that Mark would be uh, the man to carry the flag for Ireland uh, here in Cleveland. Um, 
He's already been active, I know, because he was on the job when I last came, but today is poetic in a way, and that we get to cut the ribbon and say he's up and running. So you all know him, uh, make use of him now. Um, I'll also have the, uh, the happy task of being, and I see Marilyn's with us today, tomorrow night with the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians for a testimonial dinner with Marilyn um, Madigan and, uh, and friends. <laughs> I also, of course, won't miss my quick 48-hour uh, visit um, not to meet some of your local political class. I look forward to speaking with the governor this afternoon. I'll also be working uh, during the day uh, in conversation with Chris Ronane um, and tomorrow uh, meeting some of the business community. So it's a visit that covers, you know, of course, uh, political uh, and economic relations. The most important thing I do every day in my job is about the people-to-people -people relations between our two uh, nations. Importantly, Cleveland ranks exceptionally, if I may say. Uh, you're our top, one of our top 10 um, uh, homes uh, for, of Irish America, if I can use that term. Um, you have over 12% of your population in this great state um, who have roots in Ireland. Many, many, many of you from my last visit from Mayo, many from Ackle. Yes. I'll have to recognize <laughs> that straight away. Um, so I'm looking forward to meeting uh, people this evening. I know there'll be a reception um, hosted by the Mayo uh, contingent, the Mayo Association marking the opening of our honorary consulate. So all round, in a way, celebratory, but with that work element in there. Well, wonderful that this visit is all about celebration. And as you alluded to, there are long-standing and deep ties between Cleveland and Ireland. And obviously with the inauguration of the direct Aer Lingus flight in May, we here are very excited about the future possibilities for Cleveland area businesses to be able to use Ireland as a gateway uh, into Europe. And I'm wondering from, from your perspective, um, how could we, going forward, continue to further strengthen this great relationship between the Cleveland area and Ireland? You know, I've used the word poetic once, so this will be my last time because Irish people are always <laughs> accused of uh, speaking in, in poetry uh, or, or narrative. I think it is, though, a nice poetic bookend. You have a, a St. Patrick's Day parade that's 175 years old here. Uh, many of the people who came and marched in that parade for the first time didn't leave the country I'm proud to represent today out of choice. They left out of necessity and in many cases because they couldn't feed their children. Um, today, we're looking at this remarkable development of the only international flight out of Cleveland Airport into the country I'm so proud to represent. The people who left Ireland under duress would not recognize the country I represent yes. today. And that's a good thing, in my view. Uh, we are a dynamic, progressive 21st century tiny island, that hasn't changed. We're still stuck out there <laughs> in the Atlantic. Uh, but when you look at us, we are a leading, and I say that uh, advisedly, a leading member of the European Union, 50 years a member of the European <coughs> Union. Again, this year, the most dynamic uh, economy in the Eurozone. So we offer huge opportunity uh, to Cleveland um, uh, in both directions. Right. So I always, speak about the local relationships in the context of the bigger relationship we have economically uh, here in the United States. The US is Ireland's biggest single trading partner, our biggest uh, source of uh, export. Um, so there is no doubt that the economic relationship between the United States and Ireland is primordial for Ireland. Um, we have in Ireland um, almost a thousand US companies who are working and a number of those uh, are local here in, um, in Cleveland. Um, I know that, and I will have to look at the, so I don't uh, bludgeon the name, Squire Patton Boggs, mm -hmm. uh, Law, Eaton Power, Steris, uh, Sterilization, Cook, Cook, Concentric, Concentrix, am I saying that correctly? Nearly, um, <laughs> all, <laughs> nearly I heard from the honorary council, so I'm getting there. Um, all already investing in Ireland, part of that huge um, investment in the Irish economy, 
uh, a couple of, well, 160,000 jobs directly from US investors in Ireland, um, about 100,000 indirectly. You've all heard that before. You know you're a primary partner for us. And we hope to see more businesses from Cleveland move uh, into Ireland. But what's not often spoken about, and which is really important in my view, is that Ireland, that dynamic EU gateway to Europe right. economy, and I'll come back to the gateway in a moment, that economy that I represent is, is investing in every state in the United States. So we're in all 50 states. Irish investors support 100,000 jobs here in the United States directly today and growing. Um, and, I, you know, I think that when I tell you that we are the ninth source of foreign direct investment for the United States, that puts a small economy like Ireland in the middle of the Atlantic, five million people, way up there, if you consider the G7 our global actors of an extraordinary proportion, uh, then you look at Ireland. We are your ninth source of FGI. The intimacy, the sincerity, and the depth of the economic relationship between us is second to none. And I think that this relationship with Cleveland will, will continue to grow and grow. We have Irish economic actors here on the ground in Cleveland. Um, and we know that um, we have more of uh, our investors in Ireland now. There, it, we've never been closer, if, if you think about that direct flight, right. as cutting the distance, cutting the, the reach that's involved in having an investor come in and create jobs locally. I'd also hope, I'll finish on this uh, point, that that's the tip of the iceberg, that the economic relationship, it's the most visible. You see an investor coming in, creating jobs. But what I would like to see particularly is the educational links. And I know we have Case Western here. We have other university interests in the room, I'm sure. You know, our, our pipeline of people-to-people -people exchange is changing. It's, some people argue it's drying up because we don't have the numbers of young Irish people coming to the United States that we had when inward migration was easier. It's also true that on the island of Ireland, we are now at full employment. So we have a four, we consider full employment about 4% unemployment, so we're at that. Uh, Mark was kind enough to mention that I was at one stage of my career Secretary General of Ireland's Economic Management Council. That was during the economic crisis that we endured um, between 2012, 2011, 2012, and 2014. We were tipping 14% unemployment then. So when I'm describing what's happening in Ireland right now, you see how we've moved in a very resilient way from being a stressed economy a decade ago to offering full employment now. That means for your young students coming over to Ireland, getting to know us, the, the opportunities for jobs. We have a, a program which I'll unashamedly <laughs> propagandize here called the Working Holiday Arrangement, where if you're in a final year of your program at university or for the first two years after graduation, you can go and work and uh, engage in Ireland on the ground. We'd like to see more US students do that. We definitely have a very vibrant inward pathway for summers uh, with J-1 visas here. And thank you to all of you in the audience who support that. We want to grow that more. But I would like to see that younger um, cross-fertilization happen, because that's where we will build our our people to people, but our, our economic and our political relationships as well. So we've never been closer between Ireland and the United States, um, and Ireland is playing an outsized economic role in its trading relationship with the US with respect to its size. Um, in addition to the education sector, are there any other specific sectors of cooperation with the United States that you wish to push forward as part of your mandate uh, as ambassador to the United States? Well, sure, if I move you know, into, uh, I, I didn't expand too much on it, the, the gateway relationship, just to finish off on the economic side. Ireland is now, we've been through Brexit, um, uh, a bad idea, I have to say it uh, myself. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm alone in that, uh, in that view, but we absolutely accept uh, the decision of the people, sovereign decision of the people of the United Kingdom, and we're working with it. Um, Post-Brexit, Ireland is the dominant English language uh, uh, 
entry point, the dominant English language player in the European Union, we're a member of the Eurozone. The European single market is 440 million consumers. So for anyone uh, who doesn't understand why the gateway might matter, it's all about scale. And it's also about Ireland offering a common law, politically stable environment. I might just come back to that point because I think in building our relations uh, between Ireland and the United States, it's something that's raised with me consistently as to why particularly investors take an interest in Ireland. The political stability we offer when, of course, globally we know we're in one of the most fragile environments we've been for a very long time, but even locally, post-Brexit, there has been a challenge in, in the UK, and certainly on the island, we've had to deal with the knock-on effects right. on Northern Ireland. And if you want me to expand on that, I'm happy to do it. But suffice to say, that is one of the priority issues. The support the United States across time, across administrations, and clearly across the Atlantic, the support the United States has given Ireland in delivering on peace on the island has been just exceptional, and we are deeply, deeply grateful. And I always add a little rider saying, please don't stop, because, uh, because we are not done. We have had 25 years of peace on the island, but that's a job of work that's not done. So if I were to move beyond our economic agenda and hoping to grow the next generation of Irish America, I would have to say the standout political challenge is Northern Ireland and ensuring that we keep peace on that beautiful island I represent. I th Well, it certainly is the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreements, as Mark Owens alluded to in the introduction, um, and roughly three years since the effective implementation of, of Brexit. Um, and I think our audience would love to know more um, and get a better sense from you of what specifically the issues are uh, at, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and what have you seen as the most fundamental impact of Brexit on the border? And where can the United States help? <laughs> well, just to start with your last point first, the United States continues to help because um, you'll have picked up that I'm intimating Brexit had probably its most serious effect, really, in relation to Northern Ireland. People will know, factually, that the people of Northern Ireland voted to stay in the European Union. The sovereign decision of the United Kingdom as a whole was to leave. So just with those two facts, we have a... A challenge. Prime Minister Sunak, uh, once he assumed office, uh, was quick to negotiate the Windsor framework with the European Union, and I think that job is done. The European Union was extremely patient um, over several British governments to, to come to a deal. Um, you know, the, there is no overall perfect solution to a situation where you have a, a part of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland in particular, which wanted to stay in the European Union, has been offered, I think, an unrivaled and exceptional opportunity to bo both be part of the UK single market as well as the European single market. In a very facile way, I can say best of both worlds on offer there. The Windsor framework resolves as best we can, as best the EU and the UK could. Ireland wasn't at the table but we respect that our EU partners were extremely, extremely uh, helpful in coming up with the Windsor Framework uh, arrangement with the United Kingdom. Now, we need to see it rolled out. The challenge that we have right now, and it's a major challenge, is that one party in Northern Ireland, the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, still uh, remains uh, un dissatisfied with the result in terms of the uh, Windsor framework and the follow through. I'll take a little parenthesis here, if I may, to say the problem is never going to be the Windsor framework. The problem was Brexit. So that we accept right now, it's a political reality. Even if there were to be a change in the British government, there are elections next year. Who knows elections? We all know how they can be uh, volatile, but if there were a change, even the Labour Party, which would be the incoming government, has said they will not reverse Brexit. So we are dealing with a, 
a political and economic reality. The challenge in Northern Ireland is that the reassurance that the Democratic Unionist Party are seeking about their place in the Union in the United Kingdom doesn't seem to yet satisfy them. We have had a number of false dawns. We have had Jeffrey Donaldson, who as I, I absolutely accept, um, has been working very hard within his community and his party to come up with a way in which he can bring his party to the table. When I say come to the table, what I mean is that in over 18, 19 months now, the elections held in Northern Ireland have not been respected. So the, the democratic legitimate mandate given to politicians to represent the people in Northern Ireland has not been respected because the Democratic Unionist Party believes it has not had those assurances. In some ways, that's you know 75% of the voters being held up by 25%. Uh, it's becoming increasingly tense. Um, I think you know we have seen uh, our own government in Dublin work extremely hard. I use this term you know all the time. We have a shared island. Anything uh, that happens in Northern Ireland impacts us in, in Ireland. We want to see this resolved. Irish politicians have been working. My own foreign minister, Thánis de Michal Martin, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, meeting in London, meeting in uh, Belfast, uh, crossing even while in New York to meet with British politicians. So there's a huge effort to resolve this, but um, it's gone on too long. It's now urgent. I heard our own foreign minister last week use a term that worried me, which was that he thinks that the, uh, the interest in coming back to the assembly and the executive is ebbing. Mm. That, that is a real concern. Um, I'll add a little concern that I'm beginning to pick up as well, which is very important for democracy in Northern Ireland. And that is that the last elections produced results with lots of young, new politicians being elected. But because they have been prevented from coming to do their jobs, they've also had salary cuts. They haven't been able to do their job and they've had salary cuts. The economic situation in the UK is stressed and uh, Northern Ireland is faced with rather stringent budget cuts. I'm concerned that a whole class of young emerging politicians now will get disillusioned by standing on the sidelines and watching the people they represent not having that mandate fulfilled. The Irish government couldn't be doing more. We understand that the British government has done some work. We're not party to that with the Unionist Party. But if I can say, you know, I, my view is that the work with Brussels is over. The discussions between London and the DUP which actually should be with a lot of political parties in Northern Ireland. It's not the only party, but they are ongoing. Um, and to our concern, because um, in the longer term, uh, we feel this is a real uh, bump, serious bump in the road for peace on the island of Ireland. Uh, broadening the question, so in addition to Brexit and the complexities of the relationship with Northern Ireland and the UK, you know, uh, being a diplomat from an EU country is further complicated these days because in addition to advancing your national interests, you also have to contribute to the joint EU uh, foreign, and poli foreign security policy and coordinate through the EU uh, External Action Service. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and specifically speak to the issue which I think is at the heart of uh, conversations between the EU and the United States, which is the situation in Ukraine. And I'll also take a pause here to remind our audience that Ambassador Oksana Markarova will be on this stage at this time next Friday with Senator Portman. And if you don't have your tickets yet for the forum next Friday, please be sure to go to cityclub.org. Um, so close parentheses. Uh, so back to Ukraine, how are how's the EU, how are the Europeans and the United States working on Ukraine and on any other pressing foreign policy matter you would wish to highlight for our audience? Well, I'll continue your ad. Oksana's great. She's a friend and a colleague. Um, she has done an extraordinary job for Ukraine in the United States. Come see and talk to her. She's brilliant. Um, so Ireland is a member of the European Union, of course, and an active member. Um, when I told you earlier we're 50, 50 years there, that means that Irish politicians know what they're about when they're at the EU table. Um, we're one of the elders now of the European Union, remarkably. 
um, very versed in how to shape policy and foreign policy in particular. Um, on Ukraine, I will say, um, just before I talk about the EU part of uh, the question, in Ireland, we have today just under 2% of our population who are Ukrainian, um, over 90,000 people. That's equivalent to the US bringing in about 5 million people here. Those people from Ukraine came to Ireland subsequent to the 24th of February uh, of 2022. I was sitting at the Security Council table on the night of the invasion. Um, up to the 11th hour, it was, in fact, it was after 11 o'clock that night, we were in the council chamber. We all thought this wouldn't happen. Putin's illegal war um, threw the UN charter out the window. It threw all of the international law norms that Ireland holds so dearly to out the window. This is something that is in our backyard uh, in Europe. Um, the whole uh, genesis of the European Union was about peace and security in Europe. And we, I certainly never thought I would see a moment where we would have war on the continent again. The people from Ukraine are extremely welcome in Ireland. They're part of our education system. They're part of our social security system. So we are doing a huge amount to support that. I'm often asked in the United States um, if Ireland is a militarily neutral country. We are militarily neutral. I'll say we have never, ever been neutral on principle or on, <laughs> uh, on values. And you, you're hearing that from us in, in relation to the Middle East as well this week. But we are contributing to the war effort in Ukraine. Um, Irish resources money, uh, to use the term more bluntly, is used um, for protection gear for Ukrainian soldiers. We're training Ukrainian soldiers in demining. We have a particular skill in that. Mm -hmm. We are peacekeepers by nature. That's what we raise our defense forces for, but we have very good skills in certain areas. We're also helping in medical provision. Uh, we give money to what we call non-lethal force support right. in Ukraine. We believe, though, in terms of your specific question on the European Union, that the best security on offer for Ukraine will be membership of the European Union. And um, in a way, it's opposite that I say that today. First of all, Ireland is well known as being one of the primary advocates for enlargement of the European Union. In a rather simple way, we believe the European Union transformed us and everyone should be offered that opportunity who's willing to come and join the club right. by uh, meeting all the requirements of the club. You heard a, a, an opinion yesterday from uh, the European Commission that, is, that has been very fast uh, issued in terms of Ukraine's prospects for membership of the European Union. I'm sure when Oksana is here next week, she will recognize that Ukraine's um, vocation is a European one, um, but there is work to do. So they, they will need to undertake, as every country that has joined, including Ireland when we joined 50 years ago, you undertake reforms. I think in Ukraine, um, there are issues, um, people use the term corruption very loosely. There are issues around ju judicial security sector reform. There are issues around lobbying, issues around minority rights. These are not unusual. Uh, in terms of countries which apply to join the European Union. So we will be very actively, in fact, Ireland back in 2004, for the last big enlargement of the European Union, we played a pivotal role in readying the 10 Eastern European member states for admission to the EU, meeting what we call the acquis. We will, I'm sure, be reaching out to help Ukraine also. The other big issue, I know you're watching the clock, is the Middle East. Um, Ireland has been particularly vocal. While I was on the Security Council, um, our main objective was to save lives. We didn't go on to create a big agenda. We wanted to save lives. The humanitarian approach to that is the one we adopt. We are absolutely abhorrent by what happened uh, to the people of Israel. Uh, Hamas's absolutely horrific attack um, was, abs was totally unacceptable. We now need to see a humanitarian ceasefire. There are civilians dying 
over 10,000 civilians, 70% of the civilians in Gaza who have died are women and children. This has to stop. So Ireland is very much to the forefront of the European Union uh, voice in that. And I can talk more about that in questions, maybe. Uh, s s nice segue. This will be my last question for, and I know there's many, many very good questions in the honest that you're dying to pose to Ambassador Bernason. Uh, so giving you a heads up there. Um, my last question is just a broad uh, question about A, the transatlantic relation. Mm. Um, and so the first part of my question is, in 2021, when the Biden administration uh, came to office, one of their clearly stated foreign policy objective was restoring the transatlantic alliance and focusing on partnerships. Fast forward 2023, how do Europeans feel about how well the Biden administration has executed on that intent? And the second part of my question is, from this close friendship, this transatlantic relationship, um, what can we, and I ask this here at the City Club because we spend a lot of time at the City Club asking really tough questions about our democracy, our social issues, and the role that the United States should play in the world. What lessons could the United States learn from Ireland about democracy and the, and, and the, the role we should play in the world? Okay, maybe I'll just very briefly answer the second first, since it's a very big question. And um, we're, you know, we, we're humble uh, Irish people. We don't believe we have lessons really to give to anyone, but we have a history of conflict, of hunger, of migration. So we've learned a thing or two as we've gone along. And one of the things that we have learned above all in the creation of peace on the island of Ireland is that democracy is, is a process. It's a, it's a delicate, fragile thing. It, there's no guarantee uh, in a polarized environment, which I, I think you all will accept you're witnessing in your own country now. We saw that in Northern Ireland. It takes time, it takes investment, and above all, it takes a political will. Um, and you know, I hope that the kind of participatory democracy that we had in Ireland, um, the United States, you know, uh, sent George Mitchell uh, at the end. President Reagan was um, at the beginning of the conversation, and George Mitchell brought it home. He spent five years listening to people and talking to people. It's a much underrated value to listen, right? And um, we in Ireland have something we call the citizens' assemblies. Mm -hmm. um, they are, we bring our citizens in and discuss issues. Through those assemblies, we have recently uh, changed our constitution twice, marriage for all and uh, allowing sexual reproductive health care for women needed to change our constitution. We are currently looking at drug laws. Uh, we have looked at our education system. We are using that talking and listening. So I would, if I have anything to say, it's that this is a hard thing to do. It's a long road, but we want to, you know, absolutely the beacon of liberty and all uh, that is uh, uh, democratic in the, in the world has always been the United States. Just to jump back to the EU-US transatlantic relationship, I haven't seen it in such good shape in a long time. Um, the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, issue is a very good example of that. We are in lockstep on that cooperation. We work on sanctions against uh, Putin. We work on support for the Ukrainians. And I know the United States feels as we do that that joint cooperation is something that Putin did not bank on. He frankly thought we would, we would divide on this. And that is an absolutely critical part of what we're doing. The Middle East hasn't always been an area where we have spoken with one voice, but in recent weeks, um, I've he heard increasingly the Secretary of State Blinken speak uh, importantly about that uh, humanitarian. There are semantics, a pause, a ceasefire, the UN called it a truce, um, which is where we would see things. We are working with the United States directly on particularly on civilian um, uh, protection uh, in this horrific uh, conflict. I think the very visible and probably the, the more concrete side of that relationship that I've been most impressed by has been the uh, Trade and Technology Council, a new forum created between the Biden administration and um, the, uh, the European Union. For the first time in seven years, we just had a summit 
here in Washington, where issues from steel and aluminium, I know that's the local concern for you, coming up with the global compact on that, um, critical minerals, working on artificial intelligence, looking at how uh, that relationship on the green economy goes forward, few bumps in the road with the IRA and some of the legislation from the Biden administration, but the good news is that we can talk to each other. That is not something that we were doing in such a work-a-day, work-woman-like way um, that we sit at the table and work through the issues. In December, we'll have the fifth meeting of that uh, TTC, um, a remarkable advance in EU-US relations. And I think when you have both the economic and the political channels working in parallel, you are forging that relationship in a way. I'll finish on this. You know, the United States and the European Union, we represent the two biggest global actors when it comes to trade, to investment, to democracy. There are other players out there, I don't need to mention them, uh, who don't see the world as we do. If we are in lockstep with each other, who can be against us, basically? Right, future for cooperation. <laughs>conflict perhaps with the church, and we all know what I mean by the church. And I wonder if you could describe to us the relationship of the electorate to the church now, and if there's anything that the United States can learn about that relationship. So I'm asking you about the, the church and state. Well, you, you speak from a, a position of some knowledge, clearly. Um, the, the role of the church in Ireland institutionally has changed over our history. Um, as many of you will, uh, will know, the church had a particular role in our own constitutional formation that no longer uh, prevails. Uh, the progression of Irish society has also meant that um, there has been, you know, a, a, over the last couple of decades, some um, periods where the role of the church, uh, particularly in relation to uh, children and the treatment of women, uh, have been issues of controversy. It's clearly a very sensitive issue to address. I'm, some of you, I, I have the title of ambassador. I'm not a politician. I'm a public servant. But I will say that I think um, over the last uh, five to 10 years, we've had a lot of opportunity to go back to this participatory democracy, to engage in discussion in our society. Um, Ireland traditionally was 95% Roman Catholic and 5% Jewish. I'm married to somebody from the Church of Ireland, um, Muslim, everything else was 5%. That's no longer a reflection of the country I represent. We have a very diverse population. We have several uh, churches uh, who institutionally engage with the government. So I think we're a better country for having both addressed the concerns. I'm a convent educated girl. The women, uh, the nuns who educated me, um, you know, I would be a fool to think I would be sitting on this stage without the contribution they made to my education and my life. Um, there are amazing actors in the church in Ireland today who are bringing the church forward as Ireland emerges as a 21st century diverse society. 
I know you tipped on the notion of conflict. I wouldn't see it as conflict. I think this is an ongoing conversation with ourselves about the nature of the society we want to have on the island, the nature of the role that women play uh, in, the, uh, in our culture, but in our economy and our society as well. And um, you know, I, I can finish up on saying some of my best friends are priests who would agree with me. <laughs> Ambassador, it's wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, I had the wonderful pleasure of visiting Ireland in 2019 and got to go a lot of places. One of the things I got to do was take a train from Dublin to Belfast. It was a very smooth transition. You spoke about, you spoke about uh, Brexit. What's that transition on that train ride now? Is it any different? Well, you know, I'm delighted you took that train because you went through my hometown. So that's the first thing. I'm a bit disappointed you didn't get off the train in my hometown. <laughs> I live, I, I grew up in Drogheda, County Louth. Um, so going from Dublin to Belfast, you go up that beautiful east, historic east coastline into Belfast. Is it any different post-Brexit if you're on that train? No, I mean, the irony is on our shared island, the only way you know you've moved into Northern Ireland is when your phone pings and you've changed, uh, you've changed supplier. I grew up in a border county. You know, I always say this publicly because I want to respect those uh, girls who sat with me. In my junior school, there were refugees from Northern Ireland. Today, if you were in, in Belfast or in Derry, you'll see anybody who's watched the Derry girls, you, many of you, um, of course, will, will see vibrant, dynamic cities there. Um, you do not see British soldiers anymore. You do not see barbed wire and walls. You see some walls in, in the cities. That's a different matter. But, you know, we on the island of Ireland um, are very delighted that President Joe Biden recently, um, well, a year ago, just after I took office, appointed Joseph Kenzie III as an economic envoy to Northern Ireland. And to your point, he has taken that train. He has been, he has traveled that road uh, from Dublin to Belfast. And his role on behalf of the Biden government, or Biden administration, is to bring investment into Northern Ireland. Ambassador, how are, are you? you? Um, Ireland's made some you know, great steps towards addressing a lot of the issues that the island faces, but also that the world faces. Uh, the population of Ireland has increased uh, to newcomers by 20%. Ireland is the only country in Europe that has less people in it now than it did in 1847. And slowly, the number is growing to a number that uh, Ireland could accept. I think Ireland's been very adult about how they deal with migrants and immigrants. And I think that there's an appetite in this country. Since 2018, there's a lot of people who want to see immigration rectified in this country. So as, as uh, Irish Americans have worked with Ireland for so many years over our undocumented problem, but we'd also like to see some increase in future flow. And I think that, uh, do you see an opportunity in the near future where we could address a kind of innovation on immigration between Ireland and the United States that might be a model, just like Ireland's been a model for so many other things, and what can we do to help that situation as Americans that care for both of these nations? That's a very good question, thank you. Um, I spent quite a bit of my time in Washington um, on Capitol Hill, and I'm consistently raising the challenge uh, of migration for this generation of young Irish Americans. Um, you know, we know, I always say this great country was built um, uh, by Irish uh, immigrants who came here um, and who became, you know, bastions of your economy, of your society. Somebody just mentioned on the way in, here in Cleveland, your lawyers, your police force, your, your big uh, uh, titans of industry have Irish connections. We want to see that for you in the coming uh, century as well. We have a number of people, you alluded to it in the question, here in the United States, who are in a, a legal limbo, and I will address that separately, perhaps. But what, what I'm talking about these days on Capitol Hill is providing a legal pathway 
four young educated Irish. We have the youngest and the high, most highly educated population in Europe, in Ireland. Um, a great appetite to come here. Those jobs I spoke about here in Cleveland from Irish investors. Investors are telling me in the United States that they can't get the visas to bring their own small core teams over to establish those businesses to grow American jobs. This is not clever, to put it mildly. Um, I recognize the political sensitivity of migration writ large. There is a bill uh, which is on Capitol Hill called the E3 Visa Bill that we have tried and failed uh, to bring to fruition that would offer about 5,000 visas a year for young Irish graduates. Um, but that bill is stymied um, in the Senate. I won't get into all the detail there. I remain optimistic that we will dislodge this opposition in the United States to migration because I think enough people will recognize that it's in the US own interest to have bright, uh, educated young people come um, to invest in your country. I also think it's very important for you to go back to the question earlier about diversity and polarization that the United States does not turn inward on itself. You're an extraordinary country, but homogeneity doesn't bring strength always. And you were built on uh, your diversity. And if uh, the next century uh, doesn't reflect that, I think you will be the poorer for that. Um, you know, young Irish people can live and work anywhere in Europe um, they, as though they were working next door. So there are, we have freedom of movement of labor, capital, and services. So, you know, the market is open uh, for our bright young uh, grads to go to Rotterdam or to Paris or Frankfurt. They, many of them want to come to Cleveland, uh, but uh, <laughs> seriously, the doors are not open. So I work every day, as do all the Irish politicians who visit, to try and open that door again, uh, because I think it's a, it's a it's a tragedy, I'll use that term, uh, it's a tragedy that that pipeline has, uh, has dried up and it's also, you know, politically I'm seeing it on Capitol Hill, we're moving beyond the second and third generation of Irish um, politicians as well who helped, I think, to guide your country through difficult times. Um, I can mention, you know, that you have 46 presidents 23 of them were of Irish origin, um, and one of them currently uh, sits in the White House, Joe Biden. Um, he wears that very proudly. Um, I began my career uh, when President Reagan visited Ireland and marked Ballyporeen as his home. Um, and of course, um, we're now, I think importantly, I'll finish on this to say, we're now uh, 60 years this year exactly since John F. Kennedy who for us was the quintessential golden migrant uh, who came to this country, who came to Ireland 60 years ago, and of course who died 60 years ago. That's a long pathway through to, um, to uh, say, you know, migration, Irish migration into the United States is part of what we are, and we will do everything we can to restore that. Um, what like inspired you to like pursue in diplomacy and stuff? Like, how did you know that you wanted to be involved in government? <laughs> well, I give you the, the truthful answer, or the uh, I'm I'm what almost you would call an accidental diplomat. I'm a, I, unlike a lot of my colleagues, I studied literature. I studied literature in Irish and uh, in the Irish language and in English, and I was lucky enough to win a scholarship to begin my master's, but I hadn't read the rider, the small print at the end, that said in order to draw down the bursary, I had to visit a career guidance uh, officer who was insisting that I began to look beyond the academic world. And he mentioned diplomacy. None of my family had been in the public service in any shape or form, so it was a bit of an adventure. Um, I took the foreign service exam. My, my dad, who was 50 years old at the time, um, died uh, at, at 50, uh, and I suddenly became very alert to what reality was all about. I'm the eldest of three children, 
and um, I was offered a place in the Foreign Service and I thought I'll get back to doing my literature after a few years in this thing <laughs> called diplomacy um, and that's 40 years later. I, you know, I always say to young um, people uh, and young women in particular um, that, you know, it, determination is a wonderful thing but you can, you know, you can deviate from paths uh, that you think are set for you. I had no sense that diplomacy would be my future. I was very invested in studying um, uh, what I call the divided mind, Irish literature, um, in all its forms, and find myself now talking about disarmament, Irish economic policy, <laughs> and the Middle East. Um, it, it's been a tremendous opportunity. I have never for a second regretted the choice, but I do say take your time and look around. You have the world at, uh, at your feet at the beginning of your, your education, and I know we've discussed this before. My questioner is someone I know, uh, so I'd be happy to talk more about that again. Madam Ambassador, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, my name is Kwame Bachwe and um, I'm part of the Global Shapers community with the World Economic Forum. Um, I represent the Midwest, so I manage a number of hubs of young people um, across the Midwest. Um, last year, I had the opportunity of being in Davos um, as part of a delegation of young people. And while we were there, one of the things we realized very quickly, um, interacting with a lot of the leaders that we had there, was that there was an apparent rift and separation in values. Um, that young people were interested in and in pursuing and what the traditional institutions um, were interested in. And I'm talking about values of peace, values of um, climate change, protecting the environment, participatory um, democracy, and that list, the list goes on. What I'm interested in learning from you is how is Ireland working to uplift and center the voices of young people um, in the policy making, the democratic process, um, the transatlantic um, relationship building and what can the U.S. learn from, from you? Thank you. Uh, well, congratulations for the work you're doing. Keep on doing that because uh, you're, you're investing in all our futures. Um, thank you for commenting on the young Irish people that you met. Were you part of the mayoral trip? I meant to say earlier, we were so thrilled to have Mayor Babe come to Ireland with a, a business delegation. I know he went uh, west. He was also an ACL. So... Um, I think he had a, a great visit, and I know he's got high hopes for the economic relationship. The, the youth in integration, I mentioned we have the uh, highest percentage of under 25s in, in the European Union, and it's something that I actually engage with, unusually in my last role at the UN, where um, because Ireland was on the Security Council, we were taking, this is a little vignette for you, we were taking a very courageous position on climate security. The Security Council remarkably does not recognize climate as a security risk. So we worked, uh, we brought a number of uh, delegations from New York to Ireland, to Cork in the south of Ireland, uh, where we conducted a youth climate assembly, essentially, brought young people from right across the country who had been engaging in their regions in discussions on climate policy, many of them not yet able to vote. So they were in these four of, of discussion rather than able to express their vote. Um, we created an assembly there where your own former Secretary of State, John Kerry, appeared, my own uh, foreign minister, who happens to be from Cork, um, uh, appeared also. Um, and we, we um, had a commitment on at that assembly, which still holds, that the Irish Parliament would hold a Youth Parliament Day to discuss climate. That's happened at least once, if not twice, since that. And that the views expressed from that Youth Parliament would be factored into uh, the development of policy. Because I think that's, so I'm coming to my, my point here, that it's great to have youth voices, it's great to have youth fora and to hear from young, so-called young people. But unless you see your voices reflected in policy, um, you know, th then uh, you won't be able to, to maintain confidence in the institutional system. And I believe that applies to you before you vote. I will have a little twist here to say that I can only encourage in this country all of 
uh, those who are entitled to vote, who are young people, to get out and vote to influence policy. And um, we were very conscious, one example in the UK and during Brexit, we knew the young vote was opposed to Brexit, but it didn't turn out to vote. So in Ireland, we also work very much in empowering young people to have their voices expressed at the ballot box as well. Thank you to Ambassador Bernason and Karina Van Vliet for joining us at the City Club today. Today's forum is presented in partnership with Eaton, and we would also like to welcome students from St. Joseph Academy and guests at the tables hosted by Armada Risk Partners, Eaton, Global Cleveland, Irish Town Bed Park, Lady, Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernarians, and Team NEO. I think I probably mass no, Hibern Hiber Hibernians? Hibernians, nailed it. Thank you, it's a group effort. Uh, as Karina said earlier, be sure to join us next Friday, November 17th. Her Excellency Oksana Markarova, Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, will be joined by retired Senator Rob Portman to discuss the latest from the front lines and the highest offices in Ukraine. We will be off Friday, November 24th, but back at the City Club on Friday, December 1st with a conversation between the presidents of Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland State University, and Tri-C. You can learn more about these forums and others at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you once again to the ambassador and to Karina. And thank you, members and friends of the City Club. I'm Cynthia Connolly, and this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.